Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought part two of Resolve for More. And today we talked about the discipline of prayer and how that can affect our soul, how we can connect with God through it. Um, and through a series of illustrations, you taught us how important that connection is. And then you walked us through um, just an example or a model of what prayer time can look like. Sure. Um, I'm just going to ask you just a few questions that sure. I think come up when we talk about prayer. Sure. Um, one of those being is, I think that even, even I, and it's pretty common to feel like maybe I'm not qualified to pray. Yeah. Like how that I'm actually going to talk to God. Yeah. Isn't that something that like Pastors do, Pastor sure. Ken. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah, well, right. And 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 here's the little uh, secret, uh, the unknown secret behind the curtain. Pastors feel that way too. Um, and uh, especially when we're new at it, and I remember becoming a pastor and, and somebody came and asked me, uh, some questions about prayer and I thought, good night, what are you asking me for? What do I know? But I think this is where I tried to emphasize and we'll say it again here. Wait a second, what was Jesus starting with? Hmm. Ordinary, uneducated men. They were just day laborers, fishermen, you know, and, but what transformed them? The time that he spent with them. And really, if you look at many of the great uh, heroes of the faith, um, cer certainly just even if you never got out of the Bible and just looked at a lot of the heavy hitters in the Bible, what were they? They were all ordinary people. They didn't start out mm. in the stained glass windows being lifted up as now that is one serious Christian there. Um, they, they, they grew into that. And so I think um, we have to just re re sort of re-preach that message over and over to ourselves. I think sometimes we feel that even those of us who've been Christians a long time, perhaps uh, the devil tries to get in the gears sometimes when maybe there's a need for some confession mm. and maybe we know that we have uh, sinned against the Lord uh, by typically sinning against somebody who's in our life. Uh, maybe our spouse or or something at work or and I notice in my own soul when I've done that or if I've you know, lost my patience with someone or ah, then I have to I almost put my hand on my back and push myself back for my next time of prayer because I can start to feel like well who are you after that, good heavens, you're just, oh my gosh, you're not worthy at all to come into the presence of God. Well, this is where we remember First uh, John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and so that's where we have to remind ourselves, okay, no, this is who he started with. They goofed it up. They messed it up. Peter said, I tell you cuss words, I don't know that man, Jesus, you know, and what was Jesus there doing after the resurrection saying, let's have breakfast and let's take another run at that. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you something three times. And, uh, you know, and so this is where we have to remind ourselves of God's grace and preach that message to ourselves uh, again and again and again as well. Okay. I think along the same lines, sometimes we think there's a wrong way to pray mm. and the right way to pray. And so you sure. did show us one anyway, way yeah. today, but yeah. is there a wrong way to pray? Right. Let me let me back into the that question, just anticipating something that I heard even uh, after I preached the sermon. S somebody said, you know, I appreciated that you used that model. I've always used 
the ACTS mm -hmm. model of yep. praying. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. That, that's the acrostic. And I could tell, uh, maybe inherent in the question is, so do I have to punt that? And this is the only way. And let's be careful to say, whenever we're talking about spiritual practices, whether it's uh, s s prayer rhythms or like we were doing last week, the, s the soap rhythm, th these are tools. Mm -hmm. th there's not only one tool. And if you don't use this tool, then you're out. No, these are tools. And uh, another person after the sermon said, you know, you didn't mention it at all, but something that helps me in my prayer life, especially if I feel like my soul is parched and dry and I haven't anything to say to God, to actually get one of the Book of Common Prayers, mm -hmm. the, the, just the old uh, Book of Common Prayer, and just to read uh, some of the prayers of the greats who've come before us and to make their words my words. Like, that's another tool. I don't have time to talk about all the tools. Now, having said that, let's just get down to brass tacks about, well, is there a wrong way to pray? I think Jesus addressed this, at least in one situation I'm thinking about, where he sort of threw the yellow flag of the referee on the Pharisees, because what were they doing? Uh, they were standing, it says, in their flowing gowns, and, and they would pray aloud and, and, and go on and on and on with a lot of words. And, and because, why? Because they loved the limelight. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything going on underneath the, underneath the water line, but above the water line, they sure made everybody feel like, wow, you are really spiritual people and you have really got it uh, down. And Jesus could look straight through their soul underneath the water line and say, uh-uh, <laughs> disciples, that is not what I'm talking about here. You don't need to get out in public and start pontificating. You don't need to go on and on and on and on and on and just use these repetitious uh, phrases where your brain's just not even, you're just checked out. You're not even thinking about that. How is that a meaningful relationship if you're just talking on and on and on and on? Um, so I think that would be one or two ways that, that we could quickly say, Okay, that we can be done with. Um, uh, I think, though, the, the, the more prevalent challenge for many people that I know and who are here isn't that they're tempted to stand out on the street corner mm -hmm. and, and act like hot shots spiritually or, or go on and on and on uh, babbling phrases and stuff that mean not so much to them. It's just that we don't try it at all. Yeah. And we just sort of punt. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the wrong -er way. <laughs> it's to just not do it. <laughs> just not to show up and even give any effort yeah. uh, at it. Okay. For us. So oftentimes um, when you talk about prayer, um, you, you also talk about fasting. It seems like sometimes those yeah. two disciplines sure. can go sure. together. Can yeah. you talk to me about the sure. role that those play? Yeah, and we didn't get to get into that. Uh, today, but uh, sometimes one of the things that can help us experience more of God is to go with a little bit less of something that is otherwise very meaningful and important in our lives. And so this is where many of the, the heavy hitting Christians throughout history have, uh, uh, you know, experimented with this rhythm or this practice of fasting saying, I'm going to go without food today. Why? Because you want to lose weight? No, I don't have anything to do with that. Uh, um, because I want more of God. And I'm going to fill up the minutes that I would have just been eating. And I'm going to, I'm going to read more of God's Word and think more on His thoughts and talk more with Him. And so there's a practical reason. It just, if you go without food, you've just bought yourself several more minutes every day. But then there's a, uh, an additional, uh, not so physical, tangible reason. And that is, um, not only have we opened up the minutes for uh, talking with the Lord, but we've created a deficit uh, mm. in our soul 
that see we can numb ourselves with anything can't we we can numb ourselves with food and just i don't feel so good about myself i'm going to eat a whole bag of this or a whole you know one of these and somehow we convince ourselves that's what our, or i'll just i'll drink this and this and this and this and this and that's going to make me feel better well no what if we said i'm not going to do that and i'm going to go towards what i really need deep down in my soul which is more of God. Um, and so that's where the rhythm uh, comes uh, on a practical note, since we're talking about it. Um, I think it's quite noble uh, and exciting and um, inspiring when I see somebody who's f taken a, undertaken a 40 day fast where you just go with no food for 40 days, only water or maybe water and some sort of uh, uh, juice, uh, vegetables juiced or fruits juiced or something, just to get some basic uh, nutrients. Um, I've never gone that far. The longest I have ever experimented with fasting was a week. And I will say, I experienced more of God mm -hmm. at the, uh, at the, by the end of that week. I would also say, Suzanne would say, I was mighty irritable. Uh, is, and that's something that fasting does, is it brings out the fleshliest uh, parts of our, uh, our real self and sort of exposes them. And you have the choice, am I going to give in to those or yield those to the Holy Spirit because of this deficit that I've created by my own volition? Um, and uh, so, so that's the challenge. I would encourage anybody who is curious about fasting or interested in it, start with a one meal fast. Say, um, I'm going to take off lunch mm -hmm. and I'm just going to pray through my lunch time. And uh, that isn't going to kill much of anybody. If you do have hypoglycemia, you may need to watch that just a little bit and talk to your doctor, make sure. Um, you know, was even faint or something like that. But, but maybe start there, and then if you have experimented with that uh, for a few times, then maybe try a 24-hour fast where you eat dinner um, the night before, and then you don't eat breakfast, you don't break your fast with breakfast, and you don't have lunch, but then you come back at dinner um, as well. Now you've created two uh, deficits where you can meet with the Lord. Um, and there's all sorts of good things that come from uh, that discipline. Even talking about it makes me feel a little bit convicted because I've not been using that, that rhythm or that practice lately, um, and, but I have in the past. And uh, so good question. Good. So as you walked us through the model, um, you talked to you talked through basically what we say to God. We mm. talked through how we pray to God. But then there's an also a portion that for me is harder, and I think for most pe people is harder, is when we're listening, sure. we're receiving, yeah. and we're getting still and quiet so that we can also hear from, hear the, from the Lord, Lord. in this two way conversation. Yes, um, how do I know in these moments if I've heard from the Lord. Sure. Trial and error. <laughs> um, you know, uh, is it audible? No, heavens no. Well, I mean, it could be, I suppose. For it some people, was for I mean, some people in the Bible. Uh, not for me. I've never heard an audible word from the Lord, but I have, uh, I guess sort of a, a two or three grids that I'm always asking myself. If I felt a nudging or a prompting or a thought that came to me even while I was praying and saying, uh, Lord, what is it uh, that I need to uh, repent of and confess to you and ask forgiveness of? If you sit silently just for a minute, you, he will bring to mind a thought face of someone, you'll be like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then you remember, I've already surrendered. I'm going to talk. And um, so I'm going to do what I need to do. I think um, a lot of it is is just trial and error. Uh, 
three things that I'm always looking at is what I'm feeling to do. If that, now I just illustrate it in a negative way, but what if he's saying, I want you to go and, and start a new church? Well, that's kind of a big thing, and I had one of those. Um, well, what am I checking it against? I'm checking it against uh, prior experiences that I've had that felt similar to when I did this and that panned out or when the Lord nudged me here and that panned out, but you can't afford possibly to be governed just by experiences. Mm -hmm. That can be a dangerous uh, thing and you'll miss on those. So then I look at God's word. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, God, is this biblical? Well, certainly it would appear to be biblical to uh, go into all the world, make more disciples. And, and how do we do that? We do that in churches and, 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 and then, in community, that's a mm -hmm. third litmus test. I have some brothers uh, in the Lord and have for years who I try things out on. Let me just try this one out on you and you tell me I'm crazy or you think God may very well be in that and we need to give that one some, some serious consideration. Well, in my example of starting a church, I, I, I felt that confirmation in all three of these um, you know, litmus tests. And um, the good thing about hearing from the Lord is that now I can say this at 50, if you will um, engage, you get better at it than you were when you were 40, than you were when you were 30, than you were when you were 20. Um, you actually do, there is a trial and error thing. It, because I look back and at first I, boy, I was kind of clumsy. And I'd go charge it out and say, well, the Lord told me to, and then that's, that turned into nothing. I'm like, okay, note to self, that wasn't the voice of the Lord. That was your hubris or your pride or the pizza that you ate last, late, late last night or, you know, whatever it was. But that wasn't the voice of the Lord. Mark that down uh, so that you can learn to differentiate or discern um, I uh, loved what you said in there about um, testing it against God's Word sure. and in community. Sure. And even last week, as we talked about reading God's Word, sure. all of these things are, they're, they're all together. Yeah. You can't do the Bible reading and not have the prayer or have the prayer and not do the Bible reading. That they, It takes all of them to, yeah. to grow. Yeah. Um, even this past week, uh, one of the mornings I said to myself, oh, I don't really want to spend time with the Lord. Why? Well, I got some stuff I've got to do. Well, but you know, you did preach a sermon about it, so you probably ought to go ahead and spend some time. You know, and so I looked up my verses for the day and I began to read. I didn't get one whole chapter in and this verse just jumped out at me. And uh, so within a few minutes, I'm writing about that verse and making my little observations and my application, which was a big application, and then my prayer, and, and I gave it a title at the end, um, like I talked about last Sunday. And I got up from that time and said, aren't you glad to myself that you did draw near the Lord or else you would have missed what he was wanting to say to you mm -hmm. today? Yep. Um, if you missed last week's sermon on Bible reading, let us encourage you to go back and um, listen to that message as today built upon the prayer piece of your daily time. And yeah. so um, looking forward to next week. Good. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week as well. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.